So this is the much awaited volatility arbitrage video. Don't share this with anyone. <laughs> this is the secret sauce right here. <clears throat> Only for you. Um, before you watch this, I highly recommend that you watch the wheel options trading strategy video that I made. I'm going to link it in the description. You're going to, I think it's a really good prerequisite for this video to kind of continue the conversation a little bit. So without delaying everything, I'll just put up this slide so you guys can see it. And then I'll just keep talking about it. So implied volatility takes these factors into account okay it takes the market price of the option the underlying stock price the strike price the time to expiration and the risk-free interest rate risk-free interest rate for those of you who may not know is basically like government debt rate in order to get the implied volatility that you see on options cards like this one for example you'll see the implied volatility over here we'll talk about this card in a little bit all these factors get combined in what's called the Black-Scholes formula. It was invented, I think, in the 70s or 80s, uh, which is irrelevant. But what is relevant is that it's being used by all the big banks, market makers, um, you know, market controllers of all sorts and participants in order to price options and to try to kind of like, you know, determine this volatility number. And it's a bit of a feeding, self-fulfilling prophecy, um, this volatility number, because it takes the data that already exists, puts it into this number, but then it influences that same data. It influences the decision-making of the market participants using that same data. Okay, I hope you're with me still. This video is going to be you know, a little bit technical. If you don't know some terms, I encourage you to look it up on Google or Investopedia and if I don't talk about it. So moving on, that's implied volatility. Now, real volatility is a made up factor. Okay, this factor is just me. I made this up for myself in order to try to take advantage of what I think is a weakness in the implied volatility metric of an option. All right, I take things into account that normal people take like historical volatility, for example, but then I also layer on metrics that not many people use when trying to figure out the actual volatility of the option. So they're very non-standard. One of the things I do is I try to get the expansion or contraction of price. I look at the price movement of the underlying um, kind of in a separate historical context. Okay, So let's say I'm trying to sell a put option on Apple. Okay, so I'll go to Apple and I'll take a look at the price action um, over different periods of time. It's not just the week. I can see that it's bouncing up. You know, one month is fluctuating by what ten percent or so. On the three months, fluctuating by you know almost thirty percent, I guess. Um, in a yearly basis, it's fluctuating by thirty some percent. So not as bad. Okay, so that's as far as I'll go, usually, is the one-year mark. From that, I can safely say, all right, this has a, any, you know, the volatility has increased lately of the underlying. It's got, like, a, a price for a volatility range of, like, 30 to 15%. So I can expect maybe a 15% drop max in the next week or a few weeks. Um, that's kind of what I'm betting on. Now, next factor that I look at is the proximity of the underlying fundamental uh, proximity to underlying fundamentals. This is something that implied vol the volatility does not take into account, right? Implied volatility is just a formula. It doesn't take into account how close to fundamental bottom a stock is and, or how disconnected it is, right? It's just purely on price. So the price could be up in the stratosphere and it just doesn't care what the underlying is doing. It doesn't care about fundamentals at all. But I factor the fundamentals in. Like, for example, you know, if you have a company like Walmart and it's priced really, really low, let's say, it's not that company is not going to go out of business anytime soon. Uh, but the options don't know that, right? What they would, I mean, the Black Shows doesn't know that. 
Um, it just calculates recent volatility. And so it might price the volatility higher than it otherwise would be because let's say Walmart is trading at like two price to earnings ratio or something silly like that. And it's not realistic in the real world for this volatility to show up in uh, pricing later down the road. So that's kind of the main difference is that I take into account fundamentals when trying to do this arbitrage. I also look at recent volume. Now you can use anything for just to look at the volume. It's not, it's not really that um, much of a science. I'm just looking for a lower volume than previous time periods. So for example, uh, let's take the same underlying, which is Apple. And what I'll look at is actually the volume chart on the right. So I've clicked on the one month chart, but you can see the five days is actually a little bit elevated. But one month, it looks like the actual volume is less. I would enlarge the chart, but I would have to adjust the parameters. But you can see how actually volatile, uh, the volume has been decreasing. And that is actually a good thing. So whenever I get lower volume and lower volatility, it's good for me. It's it's a higher priced option that is actually good for me because there's a chance of miscalculation, the higher chance of miscalculation. The more liquid the market is, the more market participants, the closer to the market price, the real market price, um, the option is likely to be because you know there are a bunch of pros that are trading it. Now, Apple, there's always pros trading it, but the less volume there is, I think I can operate much more smooth, smoothly. That's why I like to sell options and things like Ebix and stocks that are not that well visited, but I will do liquid stocks. Um, if the vo if the uh, premium gets fat enough. So back to the drawing board, literally. Well, quite not necessarily literally. <laughs> okay, so recent volume is a bit lower, so that's good. So the liquidity of the specified contract. Now, liquidity just means how many market participants are involved in this contract. So the less the better, but this one is actually, let's go to Apple options again. So sell put, pick the expiration date. I'm gonna look at the $135 contract for next week. Um, so it looks like there's quite a bit of volume actually here. Uh, there's volume is 46,000 and open interest is 42,640. So those are the two numbers that I'll look at. Um, now, I don't know exactly relative to previous weeks what that looks like, but I can look at the next week. Let's see the 135 for next week. Looks like 4,000 to 5,000. This will increase, obviously. But June 17th is a huge date. Um, it's a very, very popular date for, for option ex expiry. And so the volume is likely to be enormous. So next week, um, volume and everything is just going to be crazy 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 but that also could mean um the fat that also could mean fat premiums the next thing is um after the ch i check out the liquidity of the specified contract i check the liquidity of the underlying right so actually check um how widely traded apple is now i don't think this is a good you know good good side to do it on uh, but the average volume here is 78, but you'd want to compare that historically. You might want to pick something different, maybe maybe Yahoo or another site, whatever you want to choose. But you want to try to figure out, you know, if the volume is high for the underlying as well. So usually high volume doesn't present as many opportunities, but you got to try to massage the difference between Okay, so the price difference isn't as much as the volume, right? So if, if low volume presents um, a big divergence in price, that can get a little bit scary, right? But if it's high volume and there isn't much price action that's being changed, that's in, it's encouraging. So like volume... Can be can be a helpful measure to try to figure out the the if, if the deal is good or not. Um, so next thing I, I try to figure out is um, 
Oh, the underlying anticipated events. So what is that? I mean, that's like, for example, earnings dates, big announcements, um, ex-dividend dates, you name it, uh, change, of, change of leadership or something like that. It's going to be not so... My job is to try to go into the news and try to go into uh, the internet and do some homework and figure out, okay, what kind of events are likely to skew this premium size uh, in the future? So the most common one is, of course, earnings dates. The closer uh, underlying goes towards an earning date, the fatter the premiums become. And so I try not to be fooled by that, right? I'll look at also what the expectations are for these earnings. Are they likely to be positive, negative? I might look at some compet competitors for the company to try to figure out, okay, did they do well in their recent earnings day? Did they not do well? I may even look at macro factors. I may look at like, okay, how has been, how's the Chinese economy been doing in the past few months? Or, you know, how's Europe, what's the inflation data looking like over there? Or, um, whatever company I'm trying to trade, I'll try to actually look a little bit at the macro picture, try to anticipate uh, any kind of um, downside or upside surprises. <clears throat> I will also listen to analyst consensus. Uh, that's also a really important factor. See what they're expecting out of the um, the earning result. Uh, another kind of intangible factor that requires a lot of like feel, I guess, is... Um, how on edge the market is because a lot of times when the earnings report surprises the market will overreact things that indicate um a possible reaction is past overreactions as of recent so let's say some piece of data came out like a jobs report or some kind of some kind of news item or somebody else's earnings and the market overreacted uh, it's more likely the market will overreact if there's been overreactions in the recent past. So that's another kind of intangible um, factor that's worth considering. And then lastly here, uh, the contract margin size. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, well, let's go back to the contract. So sell put June 17th, 135. And the margin size basically is the difference between the bid and the ask. It's called the bid ask spread. In other words, um, if you're wondering what the mark is, it's just the difference between the two. It's just times two divided by two. I'm um, sorry, them added divided by two, right? It's the middle between two. And I'll also see, look at how many contracts currently are open for the bid and the ask. Now, in this case, the bid and the ask are really, really tight, okay? Because it's ex this contract is extremely liquid. Um, it's forty, you know, he's got open forty-two thousand contracts open interest. Six hundred and six of them are at the ask here, and one of them is at the bid, at two twenty. <clears throat> that means these guys are not going to get filled, right? But these people that are asking two thousand twenty-four are not going to get filled very easily. Um, but that's still nothing compared to forty-two other thousand open interest contracts that are waiting. We don't know how many are at $2.19, right? I would have to look at the some kind of level two data in order to figure that out. But this is this is not very relevant. Um, this is gonna fluctuate quite, quite, quite a bit as soon as it opens, even just a second or two after open. So it doesn't really tell us much, but the difference between these two is only four cents and that does tell us much. Um, you know, it, it tells us that um, this is a very, very liquid contract. And that actually hurts me a little bit. Like I prefer contracts that are not that liquid and things move slowly because the chance for mispricing is higher. So I would trade this because the premiums are fat and for other factors, right? Because I think that this is unusually large for what Apple can offer. Um, namely, one of the reasons is because of the huge expiry date. But if there's nothing fundamental changing about the story behind the company and there's no company specific news and um, the overreaction factor is low, then I will pull a trigger on a on an option like this. 
And that's the last factor that I take a look at is the bid ask spread. If you want to look at a different one, let's take a look at Ebix, which I've been I actually sold a contract of Ebix again because it dropped quite a bit today. It was down 11%, almost at $25. And so I went in and I saw the put on June 17th, at the $25 uh, price. I think I saw it for like a hundred and something dollars. Um, so I'm a little bit down on it. Uh, I didn't sell it for 133, but you can see the reason I'm pulling this up is because you can see the bid and ask spread is quite large. So you see it's 110 to 155. It's 30 cent, 35 cents difference um, for a contract that doesn't cost, you know, it's, it's half the price of the Apple contract. Look at the implied volatility on this one, right? The reason I saw this because the implied volatility is 122.66, but by my real volatility calculation, it's not nowhere near that high. And I have a really good chance by my thinking that the price is going to end up somewhere, you know, either just a little bit below 25 or a little bit above 25 by the expiration date, in which case I'm not going to be bothered too much. That's why I saw the contract. Now, you can take a screenshot of this if you want um, and study it, or maybe you can apply it to your option selling if you want. If you'd like to do that, that's fine. Uh, just, you know, sh <laughs> don't tell too many people. Uh, if you have any questions about the process, let me know. Obviously, there's a little bit of art in this. You, you can put some of this into numbers if you like, and you can try to make equations and try to derive your own real volatility value if you want to. But um, a lot of it, I realize, comes with just experience and just looking at it. I'm not saying that I'm, you know, this super perfect, like, calculating mind machine. Obviously, I'm doing okay, and I have made a lot of money from the contracts, but... Um, as you can see, my account is not at a million yet, <laughs> so things are going a little bit slow. Uh, mostly, actually, because of my long positions there, um, but that's a different story. Anyways, feel free to take a screenshot of this and ask me any questions you have about this, and I'll be happy to answer them uh, down below. All right, peace out.